Director at Squam Lakes Natural Science Center. And welcome to our virtual science pub. It's the last in our series this spring. And this series we have been examining little known species in Squam Lake. And tonight is one that I am really excited about uh, because without these organisms, the rest of the whole system wouldn't exist. So, uh, and they're ones we don't think about very much. And so I'm really pleased to have uh, Jim Haney with us from the University of New Hampshire tonight to talk about his work and research um, and enlighten us a little bit about zooplankton. Um, just a few housekeeping details. Please do keep yourselves muted during the presentation. We will have mm. time for a Q&A um, at the end and we will invite you to unmute yourselves if you wanna ask questions. You can also put questions in the chat and I will relay them to Jim and he can answer them at the end. We are live streaming tonight's program on our YouTube channel and it will be archived there um, if you wanna watch it again or share it with your friends. But keep that in mind, if you would prefer not to be in that video, you can keep your video screen off. Um, if you wanna turn your video on when we get to Q&A, we'd love to see your faces. And just thanks to the partner organizations that help make this presentation tonight come together. And that's the Squam Lakes Association and the Squam Lakes Conservation Society in partnership with the Squam Lakes Natural Science Center. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Jim for tonight's presentation. Okay, thanks very much, Audrey, and thanks for inviting me here. It's um, always fun to talk uh, to people from the area of Squam Lakes and especially about uh, Squam Lakes and sometimes I've done. Um, uh, Audrey asked if I would introduce myself just very briefly and I'll say that I uh, <clears throat> teach freshwater ecology courses at UNH. Um, in in uh, this semester, I'm teaching stream ecology, for example. Uh, I also teach lake ecology. And then uh, there's a course that I teach alternate years, which is zooplankton ecology. So <clears throat> obviously when Audrey asked me if I would talk about zooplankton, it was hard to refuse because that's one of my favorite subjects. And then one of the problems I, I uh, began thinking about is, you know, how do you talk about something when you know too much about them, or at least you're too familiar with them? And you, so it, 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 instead of making a story out of this, I'm going to just bring you into this, this world a little bit. And uh, I, I've picked out pieces, put them together, not so much in that they make a coherent story, but at the end, I'm hoping you'll have uh, seen some things that you are unfamiliar with otherwise. And uh, also just get a sense of when you go swimming in a lake, uh, some of the uh, creatures you're sharing that swim with uh, that you often don't realize. And if you take a gulp of water, sometimes uh, some of these you may get to know them even more intimately than you had expected. So. Um, let's, let's take a look at zooplankton. And this is called Defenders of Lake Water Quality because that's one of the areas we're especially interested in. Zooplankton, and, and I'll talk about who they're defending it against um, in a little bit, but uh, zooplankton, uh, of course, uh, depend upon high water quality uh, for their own livelihood. So it would make sense that it's to their benefit if they can keep the water quality high. When we think of zooplankton, we often think of those that uh, feed upon phytoplankton. But what you're going to see, I think tonight, is that there's a much greater variety than just that. And although that's an important group, uh, they all really depend upon keeping the water quality high so that their, uh, their habitat is, uh, is kept uh, intact. So let's let's take a look at some of this. So first of all, I wanted wanted to just <clears throat> talk about sort of the premise behind defense and the defense of of water quality. In some cases, defense against fish. And I'll just show you this if you'll bear with me. 
uh, a, a table here, or rather it's a, a, um, a figure. I'm just trying to sort this out here. A figure that will illustrate what happens when you have lots of fish and little fish and why that has, what that has to do with water quality. I think uh, <clears throat> people in the fisheries have often looked at lakes in terms of, is the water quality good enough for the fish? Uh, and yet why, the way we look at it is more, what impact are the fish going to have on the water quality? So it's not so much the, the lake having the impact on the fish, but the fish having the impact on the lake. And that's all through the zooplankton. So if you have lots of fish that eat plankton, for example, you end up with small size zooplankton, which are little, and as a result of that, uh, they are selecting the big ones, and that's why the small ones remain. When that's the case, what happens is you have a shift then in the size of the zooplankton, and that impacts the rest of the food web. So if you have very few uh, fish present, the zooplankton tend to be relatively large, which we're talking about the difference between a half millimeter and a millimeter and a half. So when we say large, they're not going to come roaring out of the lake and attack you, obviously, uh, but they're large for zooplankton. <clears throat> so they, in fact, uh, tend to eat then the phytoplankton. I'll show you this very quickly. Okay, let me just, so when you have small size zooplankton, when there's lots of fish, they don't graze the phytoplankton well. As a result, you tend to have lots of phytoplankton which we think of as low water quality then, because the, the lake is turbid. You tend also to have things like cyanobacteria in the lake. So as a result then, the fish have indirectly changed the water quality. And if we uh, <clears throat> look at the, the case where we don't have many fish that eat zooplankton, and when I say planktivorous fish, we mean the little tiny fish, the sunfish, minnows, uh, this is not the trout and the bass eating them. And so when you have large size zooplankton, they actually control the phytoplankton. And as a result, uh, that tends to have high water transparency, which is a sign of high water quality. So when we say the, the zooplankton are defending it, it's in part because uh, if we allow them to become large zooplankton, then they do an effective uh, job of keeping the lake clear. And then we also have to look at the nutrients because nutrients, of course, is what fertilizes the lake. And those also play a role. And then uh, where you have low nutrients, the phytoplankton biomass is low. So where you have lots of zooplankton, big zooplankton, and low nutrients, you have really high water quality. So that's, that's I won't try to I'll try not to preach to you about this, but that's sort of the setting for, for why uh, zooplankton can be looked at as defenders of that. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead. So we often talk about then, uh, there is a paper that was written by Brooks and Dodson, which interestingly enough, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm having a hard time seeing what I've got here. Uh, the, <clears throat> the size efficiency hypothesis simply predicts then this effect of fish upon the, the phytoplankton. And so that's really important because it says that lakes then can be controlled by not just nutrients, which we all know that phosphorus is bad for lakes, but also you have to then uh, manage the fish in the lake. Uh, otherwise, uh, you will be shifting then the size composition of the zooplankton. Okay, enough of that. So I want to take you into this world. And I think this is sort of what Audrey had in mind, although I haven't been at one of these, these uh, pub meetings before. But the idea is to explore something you may not have thought about or have seen. So uh, one of the things that we have problems with in science is we often use our own experiences to imagine what it's like to be something else. You know, and when we go swimming in water, obviously, we know how it feels to dive in the water and to swim in the water. But unfortunately, uh, there is a, uh, an effect of size 
uh, on how the water actually reacts to us and how we perceive the water. So for organisms that are our size, uh, we, we live in a, a different type of a world. One of my heroes in this area actually is a gentleman uh, from Germany who was, his name was Rex Kuhl. And he was asking uh, in, in ecology and, and psychology as well, he said, you have to look at what the organism perceives, not what you think it perceives. So getting behind inside the organism, how does it perceive the environment is really quite important. And he referred to this as Umwelt. And Umwelt means, literally, it means the world around us, but it also means environment. Uh, but the way he uses it, when we talk about Umwelt, it's how an organism perceives it. So the question then, is if in, we're in the uh, world of small crustaceans, for example, small zooplankton, what do they perceive, how do they perceive the world? And one of the reasons that's important is that they've molded themselves through evolution around this perception because that's their reality. Their reality isn't us diving into the water. Their reality is a very different one. And so um, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, just bring this up so that you, you sort of think of this when you see other organisms to wonder, is this really uh, something I can imagine, or is there something else going on there? So one of the concepts I'll just bring in is called Reynolds numbers. And what that says is that the effect of uh, the perception of water or any medium, uh, whether it's air or water actually, is a function of the size of the organism. And they, you can calculate uh, a thing called Reynolds numbers. And this actually allows you to imagine what the world is like to be that organism. So if you're a large whale that swims at a relatively high speed, it has this enormous Reynolds number of, of essentially uh, 300 million. And uh, a, on the other hand, if you were a copepod or a daphnia, it has one of 300, and if you're a bacterium, it's a fraction of that, a small fraction of it. Well, what does that mean? Well, as the number gets smaller, the, the water becomes more viscous. So if you're swimming, if you're a whale swimming in the water, it's much less viscous than it is for us. So that swimming is almost effortless. It's like the whale swimming, say, through something as, as, uh, <clears throat> as uh, dilute as, as alcohol. Whereas for a Daphnia swimming, even with a Reynolds number of 300, it's like a syrup or molasses. And when you get down to a bacterium, it is like heavy, heavy tar. So, the world around those organisms, when you get in this microscopic world, is very different. And therefore, uh, the way they look and they act and they swim is all based much more upon the Reynolds number than how we would imagine it. So here's, for example, a, a video of some Daphnia. And I want you to see one of the things that you, they have is unlike us, whenever they stroke, there's almost no inertia. They hardly move forward unless they're actually moving their antennae. So they stroke, move, and then they stop. And the reason is they're in this molasses so that their world is so different from our world. But it also allows them to do things like capture bacteria, which we can't do. So you can see then, uh, this is, this is the world of the zooplankton that they're living in, and this low Reynolds number world. Low inertia, high viscosity. Inertia means simply the, the tendency to keep moving forward. Whereas a whale, once it starts moving, it glides through the water, obviously, with, with little trouble. Okay, so um, the other thing I wanted to point out is one of the weapons um, that 
the zooplankton have for keeping our lakes clean is an amazing filtering system that is pretty much uh, like a HEPA filter in a way, in terms of its ability, the, the fineness of the combs. So the combs then have, have uh, CT and then they have CT that are also embedded in the CT. So they can get down to collecting particles as small as a micrometer or less, which as I say, is about the HEPA filter range. So whenever they comb through the water, they're, they're not just removing big algal particles, they're removing all these tiny particles as well. So you can imagine them as sort of like a filtration system in, in, in itself. And sometimes they've been used in industry as a way of keeping water clear in, in water treatment areas and wastewater treatment especially because they can remove the bacteria. So this is showing you a Daphnia collecting these small particles, you're looking at it from above. And the white stuff is actually small algal particles being sucked in. You can see the particles here. And now they're collected on its filtration area. Each one of these is just about two or three microns in, in size, really tiny particles. And now it's now the white material, which is fluorescent chlorophyll, is actually collecting in its gut. So this is, it collects the particles, takes them into its, it, it digests them, and then uh, removes them effectively from the water. And this is, I just used a fluorescent microscope uh, to take these pictures. And um, they give you some idea of the scale of things that are going on. So uh, this is another, uh, Daphnia, only what I'm going to show you here is the fact that when they collect particles, they collect small ones preferentially over large ones. And this gets to be problematic because no one's perfect, not even the zooplankton. And one of the things that they do then is they select for the small things, but some of the large ones, which we find uh, problematic, which uh, the cyanobacteria, for example, if they get ahead of the DAF and get to be too large, they just kick them out. Let me see if this, this video will work. Yeah, so now you can see the Daphnia filtering here. And as it does particles coming in, there comes a big particle. That's a... This is a carrier. That's me talking, I'm sorry. <laughs> we were videotaping. But what you can see here is how it rejects the big particles. Hey, they're going in there. Collecting, then it just keeps kicking them out. Yeah. I should have turned off the, the sound for this. Yeah, that's that's the thing. This is I, I was videotaping this for for in a class, and that's why it has sound. Yeah. So you can see that these actually a single Daphnia like this can filter uh, approximately a milliliter of water. Um, an hour, which means that it would be about 25 milliliters in a day. And in doing that, if you have uh, maybe two dozen of these per liter, a dozen per liter even, they can actually clear out all the particles in, in 24 hours. So you can imagine how clear the water can become if they're given an opportunity. But there's going to be a reason why they're defending. As I say, we have to ask who are they defending it against at some point. So 100 Daphnia per liter of water would be 100 mils per hour. Uh, so in other words, that's 100% of the water filtered. Okay. So the other thing that's interesting is that you know, we often think of Daphne as sort of the archetype for filtering. But there was an interesting piece of work came, came out of Germany a couple of years ago. And what they did is they looked at Daphne, but there's another group of, of, of zooplankton called copepods. And they're also crustaceans. But these two complement one another beautifully. In other words, the Daphnia feed on bacteria-sized particles and slightly larger, 
the copepods tend to feed on the larger size particles. So uh, what they did as an experiment is they said, let's just put Daphnia in a container and see what they eat. Could they, could, the question was, could they control the, the algae, the phytoplankton in the water? And then they put copepods, asked the same question, and then they mixed them together. And what was interesting about it was the findings weren't exactly what we'd expect. Uh, what they found is that the Daphne only, they actually ate, as we expected, the really tiny plankton. It decreased, but the big stuff increased. So that overall, there was no change in the amount of phytoplankton. When you had the copepods, they did just the opposite. They tended to eat the large thing, so the small phytoplankton increased, which is really interesting because what it said is that the best of all worlds, if you want to control the water quality, is have a population of both these two because that increases both the small and the large. And so then you get a decrease in the amount of, of algae or phytoplankton in the water. So the interesting thing about this was it, it suggested then that um, we need to not only uh, regulate the nutrients, but we also have to be th thinking about what are the zooplankton doing? Are they at their best in the lake to do their job? And so what we're doing right now um, in, in Cape Cod is uh, with some lakes there, is looking at what we're calling trophic cascades. We're trying to understand the lake from the standpoint of how the, the uh, control cascades from the top, which is the fish, and how it cascades down through the, the different trophic levels. And so in doing so, uh, we hope to un better understand what's really regulating uh, water quality in the lake. Is it, is it the zooplankton or is it the fish? So let's get another look at what it's like to be in the water. And one of the things, these are just some of the communities. I was <clears throat> going to point out that we have what's called Newstown. We often think about the, what's below the surface, but there's a lot of interesting organisms that are right at the surface. And then we have, of course, the plankton, which is small suspended organisms. And then we have the, the nekton, which is the fish. So that covers almost everything in the water column. Nekton is just a fancy, fancy word for fish in, in, in lakes, pretty much. So the new stone, what I wanted you to visualize is getting back to this Reynolds number and water. We think we know what water is like because we dive into it. And we don't worry about hitting our heads on the surface, right? But if we were really tiny, we might have to worry about that. Uh, let me just bring this up here. Oops. OK, so I wanted to point out to you, one of the interesting things is if we look at the what's called the epineustum. This is the organisms that walk on the surface. Really interesting, even though you don't often think about them. On smaller lakes, especially, we see sometimes some lakes, many, many acres large, but on a quiet evening, these um, <clears throat> essentially the water striders will cover the surface. I don't know if other people have seen that, but you may be out fishing and you just see them everywhere. And what they're doing is they're gathering up the uh, detritus, but also insects that are hatching, they feed on them. So they're predators on them. But one of the interesting questions is how can they walk on the water uh, without falling through? And so uh, if we take a look at this, one of the things they found is they thought the, the feet of these water striders was waxy. And that's why they were able to do it. When they, they took microphotographs, they realized that in fact, what was uh, making them so buoyant and why they weren't poking through the surface layer is they had these micro CT with air traps in them, tiny micron sized air traps. And so this allowed them to have this buoyancy uh, that they were just beginning to understand. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is just a view of what the surface of the water looks like. So if you were walking on it, we think of it as being flat, but often it's not flat, in fact. And, and because you have both uh, 
cohesion, which is what holds the water molecules together. Uh, and then you have adhesion, that is the stickiness of the water against other surfaces. Actually, in a lake, you have a couple of different things going on. Um, you can see how it's depressed here in the water surface, forming a sort of a hole, but it's elastic. And that elasticity is something we don't perceive of, how, how elastic it can be if you're small enough in the water. So let me just show you something here that's going to, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, so if you look at the, the adhesion of the water to uh, objects in the water, could be the shoreline, what you see is the water is no longer flat. In fact, if you were this small and you had to get out of the lake, you'd have to walk up this hill. What they've found is that it's very interesting. Some of these, these type of uh, insects that walk on the water, actually, uh, they have to learn how to surmount this, these obstacles. How do you get up over these slippery surfaces to the top? I'll just show you what, what it looks like here. And you can see it's sliding back because it's uphill. And so they have to learn to get a run to get up over these surfaces, in fact. Here's one that shows you how much force they can apply uh, by jumping. So it's, you know, that's the world they live in. That's the umbelt that they live in. And it's, it's nothing that we could just sort of imagine without actually seen it from their perspective. So the hyponeustan now brings us back to zooplankton because there are certain zooplankton that actually take advantage of the same idea that the water striders do, only they do it from underneath instead of on top of the surface. So they hang on, that's why they're called hyponeustan. Let me show you one of my favorites here. This is called scapulae baris. It's not necessarily one you'd like to memorize, but if you look at it, um, it's like a daphnia that swims upside down. And one of the things it does is has, instead of daphnia having a rounded surface here, it's, this is its, its ventral surface, its bottom surface, it's flat. And it's flat, and so it can, can essentially adhere to the underside of the water with hairs that it has all along here. So it swims up, attaches to the underside of the water surface, and then it no longer has to worry about sinking because Daphne spends a lot of energy preventing itself from sinking. So they solved that. I was very interested in, because I'd never seen a, a, any close up of how this worked and what it was like to be uh, a hyponeustin. So I took some videos in my lab of what that looked like. And I'll show you what that, I went out and gathered some of these from a small pond and brought them in and then just videoed them here. This is, oh, the other thing that's interesting, if you spend your life with your surface, ventral surface up, one of the things you find is you get lots of UV light. So they have to have pigment on the underside. Whereas the Daphnia tend to have their pigment on the dorsal side. So they're completely adapted to this upside down world that they live in. Now, why would they do that? Let's just take a look at what it's like. Uh, bu 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 bu. Uh, there's a file problem here. Let me see. Let me see if I can show this. this so this is what the, the animals look like when they're swimming underneath the surface. If, oops, the media is not found. Okay, I, I was suspecting I had too many videos in here that one of them wouldn't work at least. So this is one uh, that in fact shows them attaching to the underside of the surface. And then they have to, they almost are motionless as they glide under the surface. And it's amazing because I don't think many people have seen this. I, uh, I'll make sure that I, I, I'll send you a video of that. You can add to the, to the YouTube if you want. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so let's, let's get back to zooplankton. I wanted to also uh, mention to you because we often simplify it, there's a lot of different zooplankton in lakes. Some are protozoan, some are what we call rotifers that are also smaller than what we normally think of as zooplankton. And it goes all the way up to insects. And um, so let's take a look 
at some of those just to get a sense of the variety. So some of these ciliates are really amazing. Uh, if you look at them uh, under high magnification, you see that they're very actually very complex. They're just small. And so we've completely understood, misunderstood what it means to be small. Uh, and we've, we've often thought of that as simple because single celled organisms often were referred to as simple life. But in fact, uh, it was more the, the uh, investigators that were simple, I think. Uh, so here's one that's really interesting. This is a small, in fact, a ciliate, which is a protozoa. And it can eat really large uh, uh, objects. And this one here, this is, it eats like, uh, like eating spaghetti, it's eating one of the cyanobacteria in the lake. So they actually ingest this and then cut it off. And now you see this cyanobacteria uh, is within the cell. So it's a long filament that's eaten. So even these small organisms can have an impact upon uh, the water quality. Okay. This is just some of the variety of forms that you see. This is called keratella. It's probably the most widespread of all the uh, zooplankton found in the Arctic and the tropics. Uh, and this is a, another version of it. This Kelicosia has these enormous spines that protect it against predators. So it's, it's well, well uh, armored for the predators that are after it. This is just some other variety of, of them I wanted to show you. They all have a wheel organ, which is like the Daphnia were collecting the phytoplankton and eating it. Uh, we also find that the rotifers, they get their name rotifer, which means to, to uh, revolve or turn uh, because of the cilia they have in their mouth that brings in the food. So what I wanted to show you is, is one of my favorite rotifers is the splanchna. The splanchna is like a clear bag. And this is, if, if it were in the room with you right now, it would be like a big weather balloon, okay? And it floats around with, instead, the only difference with the weather balloon is you don't have to worry about it engulfing you, but the, the splanchna has this huge mouth and it has ice picks sort of as its, its mandibles. So it bumps into something and then it draws it inside itself. The neat thing is they're perfectly clear so you can see everything that's going on. And this, if you look at the uh, left-hand side, you see this little object there, that is the ovary of the esplanchna, okay? So uh, one of the interesting things is we often think of spiders in the sense that the male spider has to be careful it doesn't get eaten by the female spider, right? At least in some species. But this is also true in rotifers. And here is a, in a case that was discovered by researcher John Gilbert at um, Dartmouth College. And he found that in fact, uh, the females would eat the males if they didn't produce a hump on their back. So that made them too big to be ingested. So uh, hump formation in males was protection then against females that uh, became overly uh, ambitious and would eat them then. And <clears throat> here you can see then uh, the humps that the, the males have, these, these protuberances that they produce to protect themselves against the females. Uh, this is the Esplanchna female. And here you can see very nicely, uh, this is on the right-hand side, that is an ovary uh, with some eggs in it. And this, this little tube here is in fact the tube that leads to the outside. So it has, gives live birth. So it, it has its babies inside it. And then it, the babies, uh, when they're large enough, will go to the outside. One of the things I always wondered about is the babies get to be pretty large in them. How do they get through this small tube to go to the outside? So a couple of years ago, I was looking at a plankton sample in my lab, and I saw a female that had a large baby in it. 
it looked like it was about ready to give birth. And so I quickly got a camera out. It wasn't a very good camera, but for the time it was okay. And so what I did is just videotaped it for a few minutes and was fortunate enough to watch how the baby gets out through the tube. So I want to show you that. So hang in there. This is this was my, one of my exciting. You see what excites me? It's not not necessarily what everyone would get excited. There's the ovary. This is the oviduct. Now the question was, how can a large organism get through that small oviduct to go out? So this is this is the movie. Uh, this is what it looks like inside the organ and in, in the female. You can see it's on the right hand side, it looks like the female, except this is a bit smaller, and it has to get out through that tube. Okay, I know some of you are, are already uh, commensurating with the female. Okay, this is the one I took, and this is, you can see it's a pretty big baby in there, and so hopefully this will work. Yeah, so just watch this baby, okay, and you see the female here, she's moving around, then she stopped. And I figured this is when she's ready to give birth, she stopped moving. And now the baby is coming out and watch it. It's got its head out, so to speak, but it's kind of half in, half out. And it came out through that tube. And now it's, it's pulling the female around. It has cilia on its head. And so it's moving. And you can see it's stuck halfway in, halfway out, right? And then the female seems to exert maybe some pressure here with her internal organs to maybe give it that little shove that it needs. I don't know, but I've never seen anyone quite describe this, but basically it's going to push her out, or the baby out. And then what happens? Let's, let's see. It was, it, I think of it as sort of, there it goes. Ready? Pops. So it's almost like a cork popping out of the bottle. And what, look what happens. The female is totally exhausted. She's not moving. And the baby is just like so frisky. Uh, it's ready to start its new life. And that's the way life works, isn't it? <laughs> so at any rate, all that's going on in the water when you're swimming around there. So I just wanted to show you a couple of copepods. I'm going to stop here in a few minutes. I wanted to have some time to talk to you. But this is, this is some of the copepods, and some of these are really very dangerous critters. This is a cyclopoid, and if you were a small newborn fish, some of these attack the fishes, and they can be a real problem in fish hatcheries because they not only eat other zooplankton, but they will grab onto practically anything. So I think of them, this is called cyclops, and it's, it's well named. This is a cyclops here. Now, one thing about these copepods is, again, you think of them, well, they're just a couple little, you know, crustaceans, hardly visible. They can't have a very complicated uh, sex life. But in fact, it's, it is amazing. This is uh, one of the, I got caught these just outside of uh, the university, brought them into the lab and, and made a video of the male and females uh, mating here. I wanted you to see this. That's the female. The male has a, let me just mention to you, the male has an antennae that allows it to wrap itself around the female's uh, posterior region. And then it undergoes a very complicated movement of transfer of sperm by planting what would be the equivalent of a tank of sperm gets planted on the female and it has to hit just the right spot. So that's what keeps species from interbreeding is their anatomy is so designed to only breed with the same species. So just watch as it, it, it will catch the female here in just a moment. And it has specialized appendages for this. This color is really amazing in some of these. These are the oviducts.
So they have to find the females by smell. Now they've, he's found her and they're, they're mating, which is really interesting. You can see the dark oviducts of the female. This is the male on top. And he's transplanted this tank of sperm onto the female in the minute or two that, that they're copulating. I assume all this can go onto YouTube without censorship. <laughs> and now, this was just in the lab. We had them in containers. The students took these pictures. And now the female swims off. And so it's amazing that complexity then of, of just reproducing in, in a lake system. So I'm gonna uh, just show you one or two other things that goes on in these. I mean, these are not just little things that just live. Uh, they're like, e even though they're much smaller, they're very similar to, to um, crustaceans such as um, as lobsters and crabs, and so they have to molt to grow. And this is not a simple thing. If you're floating in the water, unlike a crab that can go under a rock, you're exposed out there. And so this is the most vulnerable time that they have. And watch how this female, uh, Daphne, it bre she breaks her carapace into two parts, the head, which then separates and the rest of the body. And now, she's able to grow. Because the only way they can grow, of course, is to cast off that exoskeleton, which although it's very good in protection, it's not elastic, so it doesn't allow for any growth. So once they are ready to grow, they have to cast that off and then they grow again. And they, they molt for their entire life. That uh, they could be as many as 15, 20 molts that they go through. Okay. So we've got sexual reproduction. The Daphne are mainly asexual, but they also can have sexual. I won't go through this. I just wanted to give you, oh, this is the last thing I wanted to just mention, is that there's so much communication going on in the open water between species. And one of the things that happens is that it was noted back in the 1800s in the oceans as well as in fresh water that zooplankton changed its form. This is the same species going through different times of the year. In the spring, it looks like this in the winter with a very rounded head. And by the summertime, it looks like this. So the question is, what is going on? What it appears is that these are responses to the presence of predators. But the way they know the predator is there, they don't use sight as we might think they would. Their eyes are only used to uh, know whenever it's uh, the intensity of light, not objects, but they use a uh, smell. So that these are called pheromones that in fact are chemicals given off by predators that the, uh, the Daphnia can use then to change their body form that makes them harder to eat. So the interesting thing is, and this is where, you know, sometimes we forget, we think of predators and prey as sort of one trying to kill the other, right? But when you think about it, a predator doesn't want to get rid of its prey. It wants to eat, but it's in its best interest not to exterminate them. So that the presence of these smells that keeps their prey alive, in a sense, you could think of it as a stabilizing factor that keeps them from over exploiting their, their prey. And so the interesting thing is in this water with all the other things we have, chemicals and such, they're able to detect those very species specific uh, signals that are given off by the predators to know, is it time now to invest some of my energy into forming then a protective head shield? Oh, holopedium, you've got holopedium in Squam Lake. So if you ever see something like this, this is, this is actually a mass of holopedium. In the center of each one of these little jellies is a Daphnia-like creature. So it's a Daphnia essentially that protects itself from other predators by forming a ball of gelatin. And then it lives in that. And so it's encased in this. 
And it's found primarily in soft water lakes like Squam Lakes. And most of the lakes in New Hampshire have that same soft water. And it looks like this, but when it's in this jelly form, it's very different. And in fact, uh, this is a, an example of what it looks like out of looking through the jelly, essentially. Uh, it's a Daphne without, without a carapace on it because it's protected by the gelatin. So it doesn't have to molt like the Daphnia. And I got this, this was uh, sent to me from Lake Superior and they were finding these masses of gelatin that were mixing in with sand on the shore. And they asked me if I knew what it was. And it was, turns out they were calling the goo balls. And it turns out to be holopedium that's washed up on the shore. And those, those gelatin masses uh, are protecting. So these are some of the things that, that what I'm gonna do is uh, stop because I wanna have time. I, I had some other things I wanted to show you. But I think I just wanted to have you dive in essentially to the lake with me and look, at, look around as though you would put on a snorkel and see some of the things that surround you and maybe just get some glimpse into their lifestyle. And as I say, I didn't plan to make a story out of this so much as just hopefully uh, stimulate some questions you may have about some of these creatures. So I think I've done enough stimulation. So the, the rest is kind of up to you. So I'm going to, uh, to essentially stop the share so we can have a chat because I think that's the point of part of this is not to have a, a lecture so much as an opportunity to talk a little bit. So <clears throat> I'd be happy to talk with anyone about any, any of this or other things you may want to talk about. Great. I, there are a lot of questions in the chat, so I can oh, okay. start. I can start with those. But if folks, why, why don't, yeah, why don't you you read them uh, off? And if folks want to be unmuted and ask a question directly, uh, maybe just turn your video on, and and I'll see you, and I can unmute you, so you can do that. Um. Okay, we we've got several. I'm going to start here with this one. Um, Given the effect of fish, this is from Paul. Um, yeah. Given the effect of fish on zooplankton, does recreational mm -hmm. fishing increase, decrease, or no change to water quality? Wow, that's a really that's a really good question. You know, uh, one of the uh, one of the things with fish is we're now using this as part of our uh, water quality monitoring. Is that we're having uh, our monitors? This is down in in. Uh, the Cape Cod area as well as on Martha's Vineyard, uh, we're, we're probably going to be introducing this elsewhere too, is, is we have people taking uh, samples of zooplankton. There's so much information if you know how to read it. And just by measuring the body length of the zooplankton you catch, you can say something about what's called the predator to panfish ratio. What that means is the big fish are controlling the small fish. So if that ratio is ideal, you'll have a balance of those two. And so that the small fish then won't be eating out the supply of zooplankton. So they'll be doing their job. And the zooplankton also feed the, the young of the year fish. So there's a balance we're looking at. And so by sampling the zooplankton, you can actually uh, calculate a predator to panfish ratio. So back to the fishing derby then, so uh, what you would like to have is enough large predator fish, which were game fish essentially, whether they're trout or whether they're, um, they're bass, for example, uh, you'd not like to have enough of those that they have a balance. And one of the worrisome things is that if fishing is too heavy, say where you have fishing derbies, and if the fishing derby and they've gotten a lot better at this. They used to take the fish back to weigh them in certain places. And displacing the fish can be very destructive to large fish. They, they don't always find their way back. Uh, and also they're damaged in that. So uh, one of the concerns was the fishing derbies might be actually uh, not removing the fish, but they may be altering this balance. So uh, we don't have any evidence of that, but it's something that one might want to be concerned about. So that maintaining a high level of large plank is or rather predatory fish is really ideal. Um, 
So that's, that's kind of the bottom line with the fishing. Uh, and then of course it gets even more complicated. Some of, there are about 20 uh, odd uh, lakes in, in the Cape area. And there's some in, in, um, along Maine as well that have alewives that migrate inward. And when they enter, they sometimes come in not only in the tens or hundreds, but thousands of fish that suddenly appear in the lake. And of course that can decimate the, the uh, large zooplankton. And often we get blooms then of cyanobacteria following that. So that's, that's another issue we're trying to deal with is what is, you know, what's the best way to manage a system like that where you're managing the fish, but also interested in water quality. So it's often for lakes, it's not one or the other. Yeah, Jim, you know, Therese had a question exactly about alewives. She, um, you know, expressed some concern that they're being put into Pawtuckaway Lake. I don't know if you are familiar with that particular. Yes, I, I, I see Therese Thompson is here. I'm sorry to, <laughs> to say your name. Hi, Therese. Um, I haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, but basically, we were concerned about Pawtuckaway Lake. We actually had a study uh, we conducted on there to see if there was any evidence uh, that that could be happening there, that in fact the fish were altering the water quality. And what we found is that the, it appeared that not only water quality, but the toxicity of the cyanobacteria was higher at times whenever these fish were abundant in the lake. They're not the only fish that do that, of course. So um, it's a balance, you know, uh, it's, life is full of those. And so this is not different. It's not that one is good and the other is bad. It's that we're trying to balance the interests of number of people. And uh, so with alewife, uh, that's still a controversial subject, let's also say. Uh, I know that there are lakes elsewhere that people are looking at. And I think the, the, worst, the, the worst conditions are where you have alewife coming into a lake that's also getting lots of nutrients because the nutrients play an important role. So if you upset the balance in a lake that's nutrient poor, really nutrient poor, it's not going to respond much because it doesn't have the ability to grow large amounts of algae or phytoplankton. But in a lake that has lots of nutrients, it can be much more uh, responsive to changes in, in the community structure. That, that help answer any of those questions? I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, Tino was wondering if you could remind us again the name of that upside down Daphnia. Oh yes, the upside down. Well, it, uh, that's that's called Scapho liberis. And you know, the interesting thing is you, you wouldn't normally catch it because you have to sample for it. It's right at the, the surface of the water. And it lives especially in places that don't have fish because it's very vulnerable to fish living right there. Uh, so you find it in, in fishless lakes, but also in bogs. It's one of the most common bog uh, zooplankton. So if you ever go to a bog and just take a cup of water from the surface, bring it in, you're likely to see some of those. And if you just watch them, they're fascinating. They can swim below the surface, but their best thing is about right at the surface because they're saving all that energy. You know, that's what they're designed to do. And when I, I just, so sorry, I didn't, wasn't able to show you that video. It's one of my favorites. It's just, they chug around without hardly moving their antennae. It's just such a wonderful environment. And it, they're one of the few species that's exploited that, which is really interesting. We don't even know what they're eating. We think it's probably bacteria, but we're not quite sure of what they're eating there. So lots of room for, for more biologists to get started on things like that. Any, anyone else have anything? Eric, did you wanna ask your question? Sure. Uh, hi, Dr. Haney. Um, question I had was um, with the sampling that we do for our lake ecology classes out on Squam Lake, we frequently come across a holopidium that are moving through the water column and I have not really encountered them in the gelatinous mass. So oh. I'm, I'm just curious <clears throat> as to why we have not found them yeah. there, but have found them quote unquote free swimming quite often. Yeah. 
Well, that, yeah, and, and they do swim. It, it, actually, they're very interesting because it's part of the design, which is they've got this large gelatinous mass and they swim upside down. So because of that, their antennae are pointed the opposite way that Daphne are. So they're, if you've ever tried to uh, swim in the water with just, just treading water on your, on your back, that's exactly their life. They're pushing down on the water all the time. Now, back to your question, which is why don't they have a big sheath? One of the interesting things that was found in a European study some years ago was they found a, a good correlation between the size of the sheath and the abundance of cyclopoid copepods, which is one of their predators. So presumably they adjust the size of the sheath to the, 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 uh, the intensity of the predation. So if there's very few predators around, why bother making a big sheath using energy to do that? So the sheath is small. So it'd be really interesting in that case to see, you know, is there, a, is there perhaps uh, fewer predators uh, present in that? And it's again, part of this whole chemical communi communication. You know, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, the Max Planck Institute in Germany decided they were gonna start a new exciting field. And so they, they, they built a new Max Planck Institute just for the study of chemical ecology. And to me, that is one of the fields that is, is just waiting to be opened up. I mean, we do know a few things, but this chem chemical communication is much, much more widespread and important than we ever imagined. And, and that's presumably is what Polypedium is responding to. Anything else? I do, I do have one question and Eric, I might need you to help me out with this, but um, we recently got a new microscope here at the Science Center and we looked at a um, sample from a, a plankton toe and what we saw in it, I think it was a Daphnia. Is, that, is this ringing a bell, Eric? Um, but inside of it, there was a smaller organism that we thought might be a parasite. Oh, yeah. And so um, I, I obviously don't have a picture of it to show you, but um, is that what we might have been looking at? Well, you know, you know, it turns out if, if we're unhappy with our own lives because it's not idyllic, uh, it's true of most organisms, <laughs> you know, they're not free of problems. And one of the things that happens with Daphne is they're uh, especially there are small cyclopoid copepods that instead of attacking the Daphnia, they go in the brood pouch and eat the babies out. It's sort of like, you know, brood predation. And so they will crawl in there and eat the eggs and the babies. So you may see these inside the Daphnia. They're not really inside, not, not inside in terms of the, uh, the musculature, but they're in the brood pouch. And so that would be my guess is it could well be a case of that. And so uh, brood parasitism is, is, a, is a problem for them as well. Interesting. It yeah. was fascinating. Therese did have one more question. Um, yeah. Maybe it's not directly related, but we'll see if you can't answer it for us. She was asking what the foam is that we see in rivers and streams. Oh, Therese wrote me and I haven't gotten back to her. Yes, that's a great, yeah. So the foam, uh, Therese, that you, you sent me a picture of it, and I'm so sorry, it was about a week ago. And I, I again, I'm suffering from uh, end of the semester, uh, <laughs> sort of end of the semester confusion that we're getting into with so many things going on. But that was an interesting question. And she had a picture of foam on, on I think it was a river, uh, or maybe it was a lake, but it, it was, th this is the time of year, especially if you get any rains, and you flush in organics from the uh, from boggy areas. Uh, that 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 foam very often is simply organics, or, uh, dissolved organics in the water, and sometimes that can build up. If you if you have windy days, it will churn that up, and and you get foam. I've seen pictures of it in some lakes where it would form like you know stacks of this, maybe um, several meters deep, but um, it's nothing harmful and it's nothing, it's not a pollutant really. It's just those conditions that if you have water that's mixing heavily, it could be a stream where there's 
it has to turn up in some way to form the bubbles and then they retain themselves because of the, the uh, nature of the organic acids. So I, I'm pretty sure that's what it, it, it looked like. And often, you know, you think you see foam, there's a real issue with, with pollutants, but that isn't necessarily the case. In fact, when I was studying up in, in, in uh, the Canadian Arctic one summer, it was, we, we got lots of wind on the tundra up there and the, all these ponds, uh, there was no, no one for miles and miles around, but yet foam would roll across like the tumbleweed essentially from pond to pond uh, because of the foam that was being formed and then just dispersed. So, you know, clearly it had nothing to do with, with a gluten that was coming into the pond. Anyone else? This is great, uh, great conversation. Thanks. Well, I think everyone, you know, if we think about this when Christmas comes around, because we don't usually think of, of lakes then, but if you could think about um, asking for Christmas for a plankton net, it may be the most significant change in your life. Because once you start using the plankton net and you can get really, we, we sell a thing, called, they don't sell them, but, but we offer through the, uh, the, the uh, cyanobacteria monitoring uh, collaboratives, the CMC, uh, I think <clears throat> that uh, is a microscope kit that with the plankton net and lots of other little things just to encourage people to do that. We also use it in our monitoring, but I've given those away for as Christmas presents because uh, it's a world that otherwise you really have no idea exists and it can be as exciting as uh, you know, hiking in the mountains or looking at the clouds or looking at the sky at night. It's a world that it just is uh, baffling how interesting it is. And Dr. Haney, can you tell us really quickly just the name of your website um, that you've put together with all the images that you have of the- Yeah, so, so it, it's called the Center for Freshwater Biology, UNH. So it's, uh, you can type in uh, UNH uh, CFB and it should bring you there. And that we offer like about six different keys for identification of aquatic organisms that in fact, as one of my greatest accomplishments, I think at UNH is, is simply getting students to do productive things and they've created these keys. I was there and I helped them, but you know, they were the ones that have done this. So anything you see on there, most of the videos were done by students. So this is all student power and it makes it even more uh, rewarding to see that, you know. And so uh, you're welcome to go in. You can, you can often easily download some of these videos. I've got to spend some time this summer uh, repairing links and that sort of thing, but they work generally pretty well for streams, for uh, vernal pools, uh, for phytoplankton, zooplankton. What else have we put on there? Um, Aquatic macrophytes, there's a, a key. It's not the greatest, but it's, it's a key. So, and the whole idea behind these is, is not, not to require that you become an expert in the field to, to enjoy it. And, that, and, and the reason for that is students were really ticked off when I would have them use keys in some of my courses at how uh, difficult they were, unnecessarily difficult by requiring you to, to know the names of all the part, body parts. And they said, well, you know, once they show me, I, of course I know what it looks like. So we just used images and tried to minimize the use of, of names. So it's sort of the, the revenge of the biology students is what you're looking at there. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I, I hope you all click that link and, and check it out. Um, you'll, you'll thanks, enjoy I'm, it. I'm glad. I'm always happy when I hear people who have enjoyed it because that's, um, that's very rewarding. Well, Dr. Haney, thank you so much for joining us, especially on this last day of the semester. I know you've got so much going on. Um, oh, it, was no, really... it, it, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and, and I'll, I'll try to catch on to some of the others that you're having. It sounds like a really great series that you, you're running. And I yes. think that's precisely what, you know, I kept thinking, oh, another good one would be, you know, <laughs> 
Ah, well, some- I, I, we're always open for suggestions, so I'll follow <laughs> up with you on that. And maybe we can get to up here um, out on the lake with us sometime soon. Well, that, I look forward to that, that's for sure. And I think it's going to come very soon. Uh, we're going to be in that situation. So Great. everyone hang in there. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much again for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you being here and keep an eye out for more presentations uh, in our series in the fall. Thanks, Have a great you. night.